Thank you. And it is, it was worth sleeping on an airplane last night to get here, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right? Uh, reminding me of my old days when I would sleep on a train to get to the next town. But uh, it's just great to get out and uh, share with you the most important lessons that I've learned after, ever since 1976, spending 100 days a year in Europe, living out of a 9 by 22 by 14 inch carry on the airplane size suitcase, okay? And uh, I just love learning from my mistakes. I love getting ripped off over there because they don't know who they just ripped off. <laughs> I'm going to learn that scam and write it up and splice it into my books for the next year so people will learn from my mistakes rather than their own and have a better trip and I'll have a good excuse to go back to Europe every year and update my material. So that's what I do. I hit and I miss and I miss and I hit and miss and hit and miss and I bring home the hits like that and I write them up in hopes that Americans who have the shortest vacations in the rich world can have a better batting average. Your trip is important. Our mission with my 100 workmates in Seattle is to equip and inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando. <laughs> Nothing against Orlando except for the unofficial guide to Disneyland, I think is the only book that outsells my Italy guidebook. But that's just the way it is. We like sort of a comfortable escapist travel, and we can go back to Orlando for the rest of our lives. But after you've gotten three or four times there, consider Portugal. It's not going to bite you, okay? If it does, you can go back to your routine before. But I love to, in, I love the mission of the World Affairs Council. It's the same as mine. This world's a beautiful place. Let's get to know it, all right? So my beat is Europe. Um, it's, for me, the wading pool for world exploration. My favorite country is India. I love traveling all over the place, but as a teacher, I do Europe, and I want to be the best at Europe. And I started my business discovering places like this, somehow keeping their head above the flood of the modern world. I found um, wonderful places nestled in the Riviera that don't have any modern buildings. Governments prohibit them from building any comfortable hotels. It's just the old world. No comfortable hotels. I think that's great because it keeps away the most obnoxious slice of the traveling public. People who insist on comfortable hotels. This is hardcore Italy, and you got it in 2023 if you want it. So that's what I write about in my book, Europe Through the Back Door. It's a philosophy of traveling, uh, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, in the beginning, that's all I ever talked about. Uh, later on, well, over the years, we've written 50 guidebooks that cover all of Europe, and uh, that's our passion, that's our foundation. Later on, I got into teaching history and art for travelers. Um, I used to give an all-day budget travel class on Saturday and a six-hour art and history lecture on Sunday, and I'd give that anywhere I could gather a crowd like this. Um, I wrote a book uh, to help travelers. You know, it's a designed for smart people who were sleeping in their history and art classes before they knew they were going to Europe. Now you wish you knew who the Etruscans were. Okay, this will help you out. Um, as a tour guide, for 25 years I was holding the mic and leading my groups around Europe. Uh, now I'm, I have 150 guides, and as was mentioned, we take about 30,000 people on our tours every year. But we just love to make teaching art and history appreciation fun and meaningful. I mean, just just a year ago, I was, uh, work, I was taking a guide mentoring tour, these are all guides, and uh, teaching them how I like to teach Gothic architecture. It takes 13 tourists to build a Gothic cathedral. You need six columns, six buttresses, and one spire. You hoist that spire, and now you step into a Gothic cathedral, and you understand why, there can, why there's pointed arches and why there's so much light in that place. It's the triumph of the high Middle Ages, you know? So we spent the last two years producing this, the same thing I used to teach in my six-hour all-day Sunday class, it's called The Art of Europe, and that's airing all over the United States on public television. I'd love to talk about that, too, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about what I think is the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. The bottom one is that skills. After that, you slide up Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. I just made that up. And you come to history and art and cuisine and culture. And the very top is traveling in a way that, that lets you take home the most beautiful souvenir. And that's a broader perspective. A broader perspective a joy in getting out and getting to know the other 96% of humanity. A recognition that a big country like ours, people from that country tend to be ethnocentric. We're not bad, we're just naive from a global point of view. We think we're the norm, which is pretty silly, unless you've never traveled. If you've never traveled, it's reasonable to think we're the norm. It's reasonable to think we're exceptional. The only thing exceptional about us is that we could think we're exceptional. 
It's amazing. We need to get out there and get to know the world. So that's what I like to talk about more than anything else. Uh, you know, if I can produce a TV show about Iran, I will. If I can produce a TV show about the Holy Land, I will. If I can teach about the lessons we learn from our travels, I will. And I'd love to talk about that today. So I'm going to really rush this, uh, not rush, but I'm going to I'm just do a very uh, abbreviated version of what I'd like to talk about, knowing that if you want to get more information on that, all of my lectures in their longest form are available for free anytime on my website. So you can get, you know, six hours of art and six hours of how to pack light and all sorts of stuff if you want. And there's this version, this talk in a much longer version. But I'm very excited about our Q&A that we're going to have when Lauren joins me up here in just a little more than half an hour. So, um, but I'll talk about these highlights with the help of these photographs. Um, for me, and again, Europe is my beat. You could go, you could, I could be teaching Pacific Rim or Latin America or whatever, but for me, it's, it's Europe. It's the, it's the springboard for world exploration. And uh, you gain an appreciation of nature. Nature is so accessible. She looks rugged, but I'll admit, I'm standing on the edge of a revolving restaurant to take the photograph, and we rode the lift up for breakfast, all right? And you can get up there by the lift, and then you can hike or frolic all the way across that meadow. In fact, you could hike or frolic from France to Slovenia and never come out of the mountains, enjoying trails like this all the way. It's an amazing opportunity to gain an appreciation of nature when you travel. Uh, and uh, when you think about nature, you've got to think about climate change. And this is sort of the white elephant in the room of any, any travel lecture. I was just at the big, giant consumer travel show in Los Angeles last week, giving a one-hour talk on the ethics of travel in a warming world. And I don't have a time to give that whole talk now, but um, I would mention on my website, uh, I've got a, a one hour presentation on climate change and the ethics of travel that I'd love to share, but I'll give you it in a nutshell. Here's one of my favorite towns in Europe, Vernazza in the Cinque Terre. And it was built in the Middle Ages on a, on a ravine and they paved over that ravine to give it its main, main drag right here in relatively modern times. And the surrounding uh, vineyards uh, serve as a big funnel. And in normal times, rain comes down gradually and it all flows under the bridge, you know? But in climate change times, you get the same amount of rain per year, but it comes at the same time. You got mon monsoon downpours in Munich like never before. This is not a once in a 500 year storm unless you're just looking backwards. This is a once every decade storm and then it's gonna get annual, you see. But here's my favorite town one day, and here's that same street the next. And they had, a, they had a, a, a violent storm, and it flooded the place with six feet of mud, and it was uninhabitable for nearly a year, and finally it was rebuilt. But that is an example of the violent weather we'll all be dealing with, and people will be telling us it's a once in a 500 year storm, and we won't wake up. Uh, uh, but you know, you go to Venice, and uh, you know, the Mediterranean's rising, and when you've got a combination of a wind and a high tide and uh, whatever else is going on with the barometric pressure, you've got a flooded main square. It's happening now much more than it used to happen. Uh, this is Hamburg. Hamburg, a great city in the north of Germany, uh, built on a river, and they've built huge levees all along miles of riverfront, which you have to do now. I was just in Alexandria in Egypt, and it was a horrible fight. The most beautiful front, yeah, front Art Deco uh, you know, promenade like on the front of Havana and so on, stacked with concrete bricks another four feet high, completely obliterating the charm of that beautiful town, that, elegant, that once elegant town, and that's our future. Germany has enough money to make it look good, but the fact is buildings now are on stilts and the ground floor is for parking only. This is a Europe that is adapting to climate change. All over South England, towns that didn't need floodgates have put floodgates so the little towns don't flood. The Dutch are famously frugal. They're spending billions of euros moving around mud to bolster their dikes in anticipation of a higher, uh, higher sea level. This is the storm barrier in front of Rotterdam we need something like this in New York. We need something like this in New Orleans. We need something like this in San Diego. Uh, you know, Rotterdam has a million people protected by that storm barrier. Imagine two Eiffel Towers on their side on wheels rolling tight in the an anticipation of high water. Uh, Europe is, is investing mightily in this and uh, we're all trying to wake up to the reality that 
as a family of nations, we need to get serious about climate change. Uh, many of my friends in Europe never get around to learning how to drive because public transportation is so handy. It just doesn't make sense. This is the, a former main street in Amsterdam, and it occurred to me, where are the cars? Now there's two trolley lines, there's two bike paths and two pedestrian paths, grass and the sound of birds. They told me there'll be no more fossil-driven uh, vehicles in Amsterdam within a couple of years, on the canals or on the streets. It's a bicyclist's world. Uh, this is exciting, and this is a little overdue. As a tour company, to be ethical, I need to tax myself. Nothing to brag about, but I just tell people about it because we have to get a little bit real about this. I don't want to be flight shamed out of my travels because the future needs people to understand each other through travel. Travel is a really important force for peace, but we need to maximize the positives of travel and minimize the negatives of travel if we're going to do that in a good stewardship kind of way. So my mission is to help people have transformational travels and to come home with a global perspective so when they step into the voting booth here, they're voting for people south of the border as well as their families, you know. Uh, and at the same time, as a company, I should pay my way from a carbon point of view. Scientists know if you invest smartly $30, an American can fly to Europe and back, and with that $30, mitigate the carbon they create. And um, what I like to do is consider that a cost of offering my tours, and we spend $30 for every person we take to Europe invested in Nonprofit organizations in the developing world that help farmers do their work while contributing less to climate change. The conventional way for a first world company would be to buy carbon offsets, but I wanted to do something a little more entrepreneurial, a little more creative, help farmers who are struggling south of the border. Half of humanity, if I understand it correctly, is smallholder farmers, little family-run farms. Half of humanity trying to live on $5 a day or less, desperately just trying to make ends meet and doing their agriculture in a way that contributes quite a lot to climate change. My program is not to help people who are hurt by climate change. That's a wholly legitimate thing. But what I want to do is help farmers do their work while contributing less to climate change by employing climate-smart agriculture techniques. It's exciting to learn about. And what we do is we take the 30,000 people we take to Europe, multiply it by $30, that's $900,000, round it up to a million, find 10 organizations that are helping third world farmers protect their forests and protect their water table and do their living while contributing less to climate change and give each of those 10 organizations $100,000 a year in the name of our travelers who are contributing all that carbon to go to Europe. And then my travelers have the peace of mind of knowing they're carbon neutral and so do we as an ethical tour company. Again, nothing to brag about, but that should be a baseline in our society, in a society that will never tax us on carbon because it's not good for the short-term economy. We need to look at the long-term economy if we're going to be honest with ourselves. It's going to take some leadership in the business community. And uh, right on the top of the uh, essay on my website, it says, if you're a tour company, steal this program and do not credit us. Uh, it's just time to, I think it's time to do something about that. So it's not the answer, but it's a step in the right direction, and we can still travel. I think it's important to travel to celebrate the diversity on this planet and not be so darn afraid of things. We live in a very frightened time. When I started teaching, people said, bon voyage. Anybody here old enough to remember bon voyage? When was the last time somebody said bon voyage? Wouldn't it be refreshing if somebody just said, have a great trip, bon voyage? No, have a safe trip. We'll pray for you. <laughs> do you think, considering all that's going on and the fact that you do have children, that you should be going over to Europe at this time? Well, of course you should be. If you care about peace, if you care about sustainability, if you care about stability on this planet, you'll travel. And if you know the statistics of what's safe, if you love your family, you'll take them to Europe tomorrow. We live in the dangerous place. If somebody tells me, have a safe trip, I'm inclined to tell them, have a safe stay at home. <laughs> the flip side of travel... No, the, the fear is the thing I'm, I'm concerned about. The flip side of fear is understanding, and we gain understanding when we travel. The most frightened people in our society, think about it, who are the most frightened people? People with no passports. People whose worldview is shaped by commercial news. They choose the medium they like to make them feel good, and it scares the heck out of them because then there's better viewership and they get to charge more for their ads. It's kind of simple to me. And sadly, these people who have never traveled are the ones that are the most afraid of the world. And what do they want to do? Build walls. What do people who travel want to do? 
build bridges. What's going to make our world a safer place? Bridges. It's so fundamental. And you learn that when you travel. You learn to celebrate the diversity on this planet. You learn to go into a cheese shop in Paris where they have a different cheese for every day of the year. It's a festival of mold. And the monger is evangelical about his cheese. And he sees me, the American bumpkin. Monsieur, come here, s'il vous plaît. And he grabs a moldy wad of goat cheese, takes a deep whiff. Oh, smell this cheese. It smells like the feet of angels. <laughs> wow, I'm your bumpkin. Turn me on, you know. Give me your best. We need to get out there with the spirit of adventure and enjoy getting out of our comfort zone. That's what I love about travel. Simple as cheese is, you learn about a lot about yourself, your family, your, your society, and your home if you leave it and look at it from a distance. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. You meet people you wouldn't meet otherwise. It doesn't need to be earth-shaking encounters. It's just you meet different people. Let me just do a homogeneity check here. Yeah, it's kind of what I suspected. It's about like Seattle. Now, it's, and we hang out with our tribe. It's, it's okay. I celebrate Christmas the way a good Lutheran Norwegian should, you know? Uh, and um, that's just kind of a reality. But it is healthy to get out of our comfort zone and find ourselves where we're the oddballs, where we meet people who see, have a different life story. It just, it's stimulating. It's a celebration. One of my favorite places to travel is Ireland, because in Ireland, I enjoy the sensation that I'm understanding a foreign language. <laughs> and in a Gaeltec, that's a place on the west of Ireland, which is a traditional zone where the government actually, actually has, dead, has declared it a national park for the culture, and it subsidizes the traditional lifestyles and the traditional Irish language and so on. You go to a Gale Tech, not only do people have the gift of gab, but they speak it in Irish instead of English. These two guys speak English or Irish together, but when I walk up, they turn to me and speak English. And a typical tourist wouldn't even know they switch language, but their first language is Irish. Uh, and then you talk to them. I was talking to this guy after the guy on the left. After a while, I said, uh, uh, "Were you born here?" He said, "No, it's about five miles down the road." <laughs> you just, if, you, if you've got some high-powered uh, itinerary today and you meet these two guys, this is more important than another castle, you see. So you meet people. That's what carbonates the experience. I get to meet a lot of people in my research. I was researching my guidebook in Italy, and I went to this little church up in the mountains, and I met the monk who was in charge of the church. And he didn't like the way I wrote up his uh, monastery, so he helped me uh, write it a little more accurately. And uh, then he said, would you like to come in and have some of my homemade limoncello? I said, si, senor, <laughs> that'd be great. And uh, we went in there and uh, actually got a little bit tipsy with my monk friend here. And uh, it was an it was a experience I'll never forget. It was beautiful. So many great people we can meet in our travels. I am a cultural chameleon. I physically, I think I, it's weird, I almost change when I cross a border into a different culture. Um, I want to be a temporary local. Uh, I don't get into chocolate here. Uh, it's just chocolate. It's nice, but it's not to die for. Uh, but in Belgium, you can make a case that chocolate is to die for. And in Belgium, I'll go to the finest little chocolateria, and I'll talk to the lady who's the third generation of chocolate makers in that family, and I'll buy a little smattering of the greatest chocolate possible, and I'll learn all about it, and I'll savor it, you see? I don't, I don't think I've ever brewed tea in this hemisphere. I just don't get tea. But in England, every night, I have a nice a spot of tea just feels right in the bed and breakfast. You know, you got that maker right there. It's just so British. It's so English. Uh, I don't drink whiskey in this hemisphere. But in Scotland, I've got a small little flask of whiskey when I travel. And every night, I have a wee nip. Uh, I don't play petanque very often in Seattle. But I play petanque almost daily in France. I don't play backgammon very often. But I play backgammon almost daily when I'm in Turkey. Uh, I never go home after a long day of work in Seattle and crave a nice cloudy glass of ouzo. But when I'm on a Greek island, I don't let a sun go down without a nice cloudy glass of ouzo. Do you see what I mean? So don't demand what you're used to. Try what other people are enjoying. My, one of my favorite chores as a tour guide, when I cross the border from Switzerland to France with 24 Americans on my bus, it's time for escargot. 
Wow. Now, some people say, no, no, I don't eat snails. On a Rick Steves tour, you eat snail. One. One snail. I buy two dozen. Everybody's got to try one. Crinkle up your nose. I don't care. And if, as, if you have not had escargot in France, you don't have any business judging escargot. Seriously, you can't judge it in the United States. So try it in Paris. Try it in France. If you don't like it, good. You know. You tried it. But half of the people, tomorrow night, when the dinner's on their own, they, o they order half a dozen escargot for themselves, you see. I've broadened their perspective. Their world is a, they've got a, another color on their palette. It's a beautiful thing. As travelers, we need to see things in the proper context. Not judging it by politically correct 2023 sensibilities or anything like that. Let it take you back. Who paid for it and why? What was going on? The greatest church in Christendom is St. Peter's in the Vatican, in Rome. The spiritual headquarters for a billion Roman Catholics. For many years, I went to this church with a bad attitude. Angry Protestant. And I never enjoyed St. Peter's Basilica. Then it occurred to me, park your Lutheran sword at the door and go in as a temporary Roman Catholic. If you're not Catholic, become one at least for your visit. And all of a sudden, you see what this is all about. 500 years ago, this is the best humankind could do to get close to God and to glorify God. You see, that is so exciting to give yourself a chance to appreciate things on its terms. Know what you're looking at. Simple. If you see a guy at St. Peter's with a bushy beard and a key, it's St. Peter. He's buried under the, under the main altar and above in six-foot-tall letters it says, to S. Petrus, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It's, I get goosebumps just thinking about how beautiful that is. But you got to have a, a positive mindset towards whatever mosque or synagogue or church or gallery or palace you're visiting. Try to understand it on its terms. Remember, Europe is into liberties. We have our Statue of Liberty in Salvador Dali's hometown of Cadiz. They think they've even got more liberty. They think they've got double the liberty. All over the world, people have their own visions of liberty, and they celebrate it on their cultural terms. I just There's a little town in northern Italy that every summer has a festival where the older kids teach the younger kids how to make a good ravioli. It's a beautiful way to weave into the society a passing of the guard when it comes to just dimensions of their culture they want to survive with the next generation. Here in a little village in Burgundy, the Chamber of Commerce pooled its humble resources to make these orbs where visitors can appreciate the fine differences in the bouquet of the wine they grow in that valley. What a delightful thing. So much pride, and we can learn and appreciate. I love to go to a market where people eagerly pay too much for their bread in order to buy it from the person who baked it. It's just a family's value thing. Here we have a diff we're wired to think, I want to have a freezer in the garage, so I only have to go shopping every other week. It's more efficient, and I can buy big quantities so it's cheaper, and I'll just freeze it and thaw it out as I need it. Well, that's fine. That's the American way. But in Europe, they manage, they, they manage to have a small refrigerator under the sink, so they have to go to the market every morning and connect with their neighbors. It's all about connecting with your neighbors. It's the fabric of that community, and it shows itself in the little shops and the pride people have in spending a little extra to keep that strong in their community. Europeans love their fine wine, and they know where to fill it up really cheap. <laughs> this, is <a> wine, <laughs> this is a wine filling station outside of Orvieto, just north of Rome, and it's, cheap, it's the cheapest liquid you can buy is table wine. And people bring a car full of empty bottles there twice a year, and they fill her up. I love just comparing European society and American society. We're kind of like sister societies in so many ways. Uh, I do want to remind you in your travels that there's a lot of heritage between the United States and Europe. And uh, we often think that Europe doesn't appreciate us or doesn't like us. And we're like, you know, bickering siblings in so many ways. But I'll tell you, when you get right down to it, Europe appreciates American leadership. Europe needs American leadership. For four years, we had no American leadership, and it was a scary time for our world. If we don't have American leadership, it's hard to rally the troops of the democracies and the free societies on this planet. So 
I don't think that's a political statement. I think that's a simple reality. Remember, Europe appreciates us, and we need Europe, and Europe needs us. We see that in the news right now as we're dealing with a horrible war in Ukraine. I'll never forget, I could do a whole lecture on examples of how Europeans appreciate America if somebody has a little hang up about uh, the French, they don't do this or that, you know. But these are French people right here. And I was at their little mom and pop chateau filming for one of our public television TV shows. The sun was going down. We're a little bit late. I get there. Hello, bonjour, bonjour. Uh, can, I need to get up on the roof to, to take a picture of the castle with the roof and the sun going down. No, we have to have a glass of wine first. Well, no, let's have the wine after. I got to get the, the outside before the sun goes down. Well, no, we must have wine. I'm, I'm going to lose this one. Okay, so put the camera down, and they bring out their wine and their cheese, and they bring out their precious 48-star American flag. 48 stars, the one they hoisted over their village in 1944 when they were liberated from Nazi tyranny by American troops. Wow. I was so touched by that. And they said, we will never let Americans into our castle without bringing out our flag and asking you, when you go home, to remind your friends that we people in France are forever thankful for American valor and strength and, uh, and, and uh, the defense of freedom and democracy. That's a very important message we can get through our travels, I think. And it is a good reminder, because it's a rough world in a lot of ways. And nations that get freedom and nations that have democracy have a fragile treasure that they need to take care of. When we travel, it humbles our ethnocentricity in a beautiful way. I just love the simple reminder that everybody doesn't celebrate the 4th of July, but everybody has a 4th of July. Here in, in uh, Switzerland, it's August 1st. In Norway, uh, it'd be May 17th. In France, it would be 10 days after our day, Bastille Day, July 14. If you're traveling and you happen to be in a country's 4th of July, man, oh man, that's a fun day. Also remember that the world is not a pyramid with us on top and everybody else trying to figure it out. Uh, the people respect us. Uh, the ideals of America shine on a hilltop inspiring everybody who loves freedom. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean they follow us in all of our trade policies and all of our military policies and this and that. Um, I think it's important to remember we have the American dream and other people have their own dreams. This is a Sri Lankan family and they certainly have the Sri Lankan dream. My Norwegian relatives have the Norwegian dream, my Bulgarian friends have the Bulgarian dream, and that's a beautiful thing. That's something we celebrate in our travels. And also in our travels, we know that everybody has their own struggles and their own baggage. We have 9-11 baggage. Still, we have 9-11 baggage. 22 years after 3,000 people died in a terrible terrorist event. It changed who we are. It changed our, almost changed, it made us do things that we really don't normally do, but we had to because we, had, we got hit. We hope other people give us a little wiggle room. Well, we have to give other people a little wiggle room too. We have to remember other people have 9-11 type baggage that is far more tragic than our 9-11 baggage if you looked at it impassionately. And 9-11 uh, baggage is all over the world. Uh, it's a tough world. And we need to remember that when we travel. I was traveling through eastern Turkey with one of my groups once, and uh, I love traveling in eastern Turkey in the shadow of Mount Ararat, and there's not a lot of famous things to see, but there's lots to do. It's a cultural scavenger hunt. We're just out there looking for things to see and experience. We came upon a high school stadium filled with kids having some kind of rally. Park the bus, go inside. What's happening? 200 kids gathered together, singing as they thrust their fists up in the sky. We are a secular nation. We are a secular nation. I asked my guide, what's going on? Don't they like God here? And she goes, oh, we love God, but considering the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism just over the border to our east in Iran, we're very concerned about the fragile and precious separation of mosque and state that Ataturk gave us back in the 1920s, and we're having a pep rally for pluralism. Separation of mosque and state? Pep rally in eastern Turkey for pluralism? Wow, who'd have thunk? How many American decision makers have an empathy for that? Understand the complexity of those corners of the world. It is so great as an individual to go there and to humanize those struggles. To meet a person in Afghanistan who will sit down at lunch with you like a guy did to, with me when I was backpacking to Afghanistan once. He said, are you an American? I said, yes. He said, I'm a, journal, I'm a professor here, and I want you to know that um, half of the people 
on this planet, or no, he said a third of the people on this planet eat with spoons and fork like you, a third of the people eat with chopsticks, and a third of the people eat with their fingers like I do, and we're all civilized just the same. I still remember him saying, and we're all civilized just the same. This local professor sat down with American tourists every day with his personal mission to remind that traveler that people who eat with their fingers are just as civilized as you civilized people that put some dirty metal utensil in your mouth rather than the fingers that God gave you to eat the food with. You see, you can make a case for eating with your fingers. I didn't realize, but he was right. I thought less of him because of his uh, fingers. And I decided for the rest of my trip, I was going to, through South Asia, I was going to eat with my fingers. It became beautiful. It became very natural. I went to fine restaurants filled with professional local people with no spoons and forks, a ceremonial sink in the middle of the room. People would wash their hands and use their fingers for what they were designed to do. I had to be retrained when I got home. But it's a reminder that we are not the norm. People who sit on something to go to the bathroom are the oddballs on this planet. It's not right or wrong, it's just don't think we are the norm because that is ethnocentric. I have had the opportunity over the years to go to some great places with our TV crew. I went to Iran just after the Iran-Iraq war and I, I was worried about a, a needless war starting in Iran and I wanted to do whatever I could to just humanize the Iranian people. How could half of that society vote for a guy like Ahmadinejad, you know? So I went there and uh, we were afraid. We almost left our big camera in Greece and took our little sneak camera in with us. But thank goodness we had the nerve to take our big camera in because I've never been received so warmly on the streets of any place I've ever filmed as I was in Iran. Of course, above the streets, there were big hateful propaganda banners like this six story tall down with the USA banner with their stars and stripes, the stripes being made by dropping bombs and the stars being skulls. Imagine being an American walking under that banner. Awkward. But remember, that was painted before any of the people in the street were born. And they have a theocracy where they can't question the government and it stays there. So we can't judge people who are stuck with the government that they can't shake loose as they're trying valiantly right now for the simple right to not cover your hair. Uh, we had an amazing time filming, filming in Iran. We produced a one-hour show that um, Persian Americans are very thankful for because it was a, just an honest look to humanize 60 million Iranians. Um, I was very proud of that show because uh, I knew so little about Iran. What I knew about Iran, I learned from Ted Koppel in the hostage crisis. That is a pathetic way to understand a great nation. It's really a shame. We need to travel there. I said it was a friendly place. We were stuck in one of those traffic jams. Tehran has about 10 million people. It was just quiet. We're sitting in the traffic, and, uh, and a minute later, the guy in the next car goes like this to my driver, roll down your window. He rolls down the window, and the guy in the next car hands over a bouquet of flowers, and he tells my driver, give this to the foreigner in your back seat and apologize for our traffic. I don't know about Philadelphia, but that never happens in Seattle. <laughs> Later on, we were in another traffic jam. It was just quiet, and suddenly my driver just blurted out. He said, death to traffic. Death to traffic? I said, I thought it was uh, death to Israel or death to America. What, what's with you Iranians and death to everything? And my driver, a nice guy who didn't speak very good English, tried to explain it to me. He said, well, here in Iran, when something is frustrating to us and out of our control, we say death to that. When something's frustrating us and out of control, we say death to that. He's translating what word that we use quite commonly. Damn. Damn that traffic. Damn America. Damn election fraud. Damn the weather. Damn those teenagers. Now, have I ever thought, damn those teenagers? Well, to be honest, yes. Now, do I really want them to die and burn in hell for an eternity like I just said? Not yet. But it's after midnight, turn down the music, death to teenagers, okay? So I would just say it behooves us to get a little nuance to these bumper sticker calls to arms that we keep getting in our hysterical entertainment that masquerades as news. And when we travel, we get to talk to people. And we realize it's more common, or it's more complicated than we might realize. 
Iran is a rich society. I don't want to apologize for its bad government and the, how they fund terrorism or anything like that. But the people, we need to get to know. And talking about 9-11 baggage, their 9-11 is the Iraq-Iran war back in the 1980s where they lost a million people. Iran was invaded by Saddam Hussein, funded by the United States of America. That's what they know, that's what everybody else knows. Most Americans don't know that or want to believe that, but whether it's true or not, that's baggage. Every town in Iran has what's called a martyr's cemetery on the border of the town, and it is thriving with mourners. 30 years later, every Friday, it is packed with people dressed in black, sitting on the tombs of their lost husband or father or son and weeping every week for 30 years. That's baggage. And what is she thinking? It's a serious problem. We've got to understand each other. When we travel, we get to know our enemies and they get to know us. I love to travel where my government says I'm not supposed to go. Our government says you can't go to Cuba. I'm on my way. And I'm not going to do it in any legal way. You know, I, I'm on a, I want to do it as a, as a statement uh, without permission. Uh, I want to go to Iran. It's one of the best-selling Lonely Planet books. Lots of people go to Iran. It's the number one Caribbean destination, Cuba, for Europeans, but Americans don't think you can go there. Get to know your neighbors. It's not a bad thing. It makes it tougher for their propaganda to dehumanize us, and when we come home, it makes it tougher for our propaganda to dehumanize them. This is how peace is built. I really think that's important. On the last day in our filming, I was on the street with the crew. A woman came up to me, who was a well-dressed, English-speaking professional woman. She said, are you an American journalist? I said, yes. And she did this with her finger on my chest. She says, I want you to go home and tell the truth. We're strong, we're united, and we just don't want our little girls to be raised like Britney Spears. And I thought, this is it. I figured out who voted for Ahmadinejad. Who was the base for that guy that until recently was like an unthinkable national leader? Who were the 51% that voted for Ahmadinejad? Were they the sophisticated people in the big city with travel experience and a university degree? No. It was the small town, less educated fundamentalists. That was his base. Small town, less educated fundamentalists. I'm not going to say the next sentence, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say these are good people, riddled with fear and driven with love. It's understandable why they vote the way they do in Iran and here in the United States and in England and in Poland and in Turkey and in Russia. Good people, riddled with fear, powered by love. It's a fascinating opportunity to understand that and work to overcome that. If we can invest in people so they're not so fearful, if we can broaden their perspectives. These are the women, this is 10 years ago, these are the women that are on the streets right now, risking their lives to take those scarfs off. It's powerful to get to know them. It's powerful to look at those faces and to see they are not our enemies. They're saddled with a bad government. And that government is there because people are afraid. And people need a better education, I guess. If there's a wall, there's two sides to that wall. You can't go to Israel and just be in Israel and know what that wall is. You've got to go to Palestine and Israel to understand that wall. There's two sides to every wall, metaphorical or physical. And that's got to be as I know there's a lot of people from Villanova here and a lot of people from the World Affairs Council that organize tourism. It breaks my heart when caring people go on Christian tours to the Holy Land and they make a little beeline to Beth Bethlehem because it's in enemy territory and come back to the safety of Israel. They don't know anything about the four million people that are living behind that wall with no access to water. It's almost, it's a whole different talk. But I, I, I went there and I did a TV show on the Holy Land trying to see both Dual narrative travel. It's the best thing you could do for Israel's long-term security is to understand that problem and sort it out. 
so Palestine can have dignity, dignity and freedom. It's the best thing you could do for Israel. If anybody says, questions your support of Israel because you care about durable peace in the Holy Land, you need to sit them down and give them a little talk or watch my one-hour show on the Holy Land because I treasure the time I spent in Palestine. I treasure it. And uh, again, all of my shows are available on my website at ricksteves.com. We just did a six-hour series on art. It's there. One hour on the Holy Land, one hour on Iran. Uh, I did one just at the beginning of the, of the pandemic called Hunger and Hope Lessons from Ethiopia and Guatemala. I just love traveling in a way that lets you understand the reality of extreme poverty. We were on a beautiful trajectory in one generation, cutting hunger in half on our planet. And then in the last few years, it's, it's arced up. It's ticked up because of conflict and uh, uh, COVID and climate change. Uh, but we are overall on a good trajectory, and we have to steer a steady course. Not because we love our neighbor, because that doesn't work in the voting booth. Because it makes our world a more stable place. It's a good investment in our children's peace. <laughs> if we can deal with extreme poverty. 10% of this planet, half of this planet is living on $5 a day. That's okay. They can't, we can't all be filthy rich. But 10% of the planet is trying to survive on less than $2 a day. Given the affluence in this world, that's, to me, something we could expect to deal with. And to overcome it is within our reach. It's really within our reach. That's why I'm a big supporter of Bread for the World, which is the leading advocacy organization in Washington, D.C., to help our government see that investing in the fight to end hunger is a practical investment for our own stability. Because you can see the success stories, as we showed in our documentary that made the case that modern aid is a good investment. And you can talk to people in classroom-type places like Ethiopia and Guatemala and understand why there's a lot of hope. And I'll tell you, in my travels, I've learned even if you're motivated only by greed, if you know what's good for you, you don't want to be filthy rich in a desperately poor world. It's just not a nice place to raise your kids. And when you get a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots and the privileged and the struggling and the angry and the hopeless, you got more guns guarding pharmacies and hotels and restaurants and banks. And when we start to see that in our society, we have gone really far. When you go south of the border, go to Guatemala, go to Nicaragua, go to El Salvador, you'll find armed guards in front of every pharmacy. That's not a good world. A middle-class neighborhood in El Salvador, they pool their money so they can have a guard on the street so the kids can go safely to the park. We don't need that. We don't have to have that. That's the symptom of too many gated communities, too many fortified rich homes and too many people in the streets. And uh, we can learn a lot about our own struggles by going south of the border and seeing what happens if we don't take care of that trajectory before it gets too late. And we also humanize the people that are living in such wretched conditions. And we see, yep, they're just as precious as our kids. They're just as deserving as our kids. Just as deserving. You know, probably the most impactful moment in my travels I had on my very first trip, I've got about four or five minutes more to talk and then I'll be done. On my very first trip, I was 14 years old, I was in Oslo behind the Royal Palace in this park, of uh, Gustav Figlin's Frogner, Frogner Park, and it was just speckled with families, parents loving their children, and my parents were loving me. And as a little 14-year-old twerp, it occurred to me, wow, my parents are just loving me crazy. And then I looked out in the park, and all those parents didn't even know who we were, and they were loving their kids just as much as my parents loved me. I thought, wow, this world is home to billions of equally adorable and lovable little children, little children of God. That was a very cool recognition. And just four months ago, I became a grandpa. Look at Atlas. Good name for a grandchild, Atlas. And when I look at Atlas, and when I look at the joy in his mom, and then I incorporate my travels into that, I'm reminded my daughter and Atlas are no more deserving, no more precious than this father and child. If you believe in a God, we're all children of God. That means we're all brothers and sisters. Suffering has nothing to do with proximity. Suffering across the street, maybe you can see it better, but suffering across the sea is just as real intellectually. And when you can understand 
the value of a little bit of investment in struggling people. For as much money as I spent for braces to give my daughter straight teeth, you could drill a well in a thirsty community, and every mom in that village could stay home and nourish and care for their children instead of abandoning their farm and their family to walk half of their waking hours to get water and firewood. You know, we could make a huge difference investing in that soft power. My last point is just as a tour guide, as a travel teacher, I love to get my people, my travelers, out of their comfort zone and take something that was confusing and scary and make it friendly. As a tour guide in Turkey, I love to introduce my travelers to a whirling dervish. You know those dervishes? They, 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 it's kind of like cruise ship entertainment. Well, they're monks. I found one. I'm just going to paraphrase what we learned, but I found this guy, and I said, hi, I'm an American tour guide, and uh, I wonder, is there, I got 20 people in the hotel, I wonder if there's any way we could watch you uh, whirl. And he said, I'm not a photo op, I'm a monk. But if I can explain to you what I'm doing, you can watch me pray. I said, great, when and where? On his rooftop at sunset, great. So we gathered up there, he greets us, he said, I'm a dervish, you Christians would probably call me a monk. Uh, my prophet is Mevlana. I think you refer to him as Rumi. He's sort of the Saint Francis of us Muslims. He's, you know, the guy about love, easy for anybody to get their brains around Saint Francis and love and Rumi and love. And he said, five times a day I whirl myself into a meditative trance and I think about ways I can be a conduit between God's love and his creation. I plant one foot in my home and my family. The other foot goes around the world celebrating the diversity in God's great creation. One arm goes up to accept the love of our Creator, and the other hand, like the spout on a tea kettle, goes down and showers God's love on our planet, on my family, on my home, and in all of God's creation. Five times a day, I lose myself in that thought, and how can I be a conduit of God's love? I watched him whirl. He lost himself in that thinking, his head tilted over, his robe billowed out, and then I looked over at my tourists, and I saw the wonder sweep over their faces. And I thought, they're being changed. And they're going to go home with a little better understanding of what this world's all about and a little less fear. And then when they implement that broader perspective into their citizenship here in this great country, they're making travel a political act. And to share that news with you is why I traveled from Seattle to here today, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How many countries do you all want to go visit now? List, everyone's list just multiplied. Thank you, Rick. Um, yes. We have time for some questions and answers. One thing I'd like to ask um, is what do you think would happen if Americans doubled the number of passport holders we have, right? It's you know between 30 or 40 percent on this disproportionate number of Americans who, have, who travel versus the influence we have on the world as a superpower affects our role. What if Americans started traveling? What would that do to the world and our society? What if Americans all had a great education? It's the same kind of thing. Uh, I think you get a great education when you travel. Uh, I often think how the political landscape would be different if you had to have a passport before you could vote or have to have used a passport before you could vote. Of course, we can't do that, but I really believe our country would be stronger and the world would be much better off if when we went in the privacy of the voting booth, we didn't think what's better for us, but we thought more in the more long-term vision, what's better for sustainability, what's better for the future, what's better for poor people, and what's better for south of the border. I'm not saying that as a nice, love your neighbor kind of person. I'm saying that as a practical capitalist who wants to be stable and wealthy. <laughs> if you take care of the, the, the fabric of your community and your global community, it's just more sustainable and better in the long term. Now that you've started traveling once again, 100 days a year in Europe, you're on the road all the time. When you come back, what do you notice afresh about our country here in the US? When I come back after a trip, the first thing I notice is, uh, in my city anyway, is the lack of vitality in the streets. My big fear what, after two years of no travel with COVID was, is there still going to be the energy in the street? Because that's what I find so exciting and stimulating about Europe. Uh, and I thought, 
you know, are people going to still be kissing each other on the cheek in Paris? Yes, they are, you know. Are people still going to be doing the Paseo in Madrid and the Passeggiata in Rome? Yes. Are they going to be licking their gelato on the Camp El Campo in Siena? Yes. Sliding on the beer halls, boards, and clinking their glasses in Munich. Uh, people are doing that. So that's the good news, is the energies in the streets. And when I come home, I want to, I want to do the Paseo. I walk through the streets, and it's, it's like mothers see there's a man on the street, and they grab their children and bring them behind the white picket fence. Uh, there's just there, there's that lack of community. There's that, you know, my favorite country is Italy, in part because the piazza is so fundamental to what Italy is. What do we have for a piazza other than the mall? You know, I mean, we're, I'm helping build and fund a, a senior center in my town, and the nickname is the piazza, because we don't have a piazza in my little suburban town. Uh, European towns are built around a piazza. So I noticed that sort of the, the vitality of the market and how that's part of the fabric of a community in Europe. And when I go home, I, I don't see that. Yeah. I have quite a few questions for you, but I promised I would share. So I know we've got uh, three microphones in the audience. And as is a tradition here at the World Affairs Council, we like to give the first question to a young person. We have a high school student, Sydney Gowie, a senior at Cardinal O'Hara High School here in the region that will have the first question for you, Rick. And then after that, if you have a question, raise your hand and someone will bring a microphone to you. This is on, right? Okay. Um, my question is, since you have traveled to so many European countries, is there any country that has developed either economically, environmentally, and or politically from when you first visited it? And what are those developments that you have noticed? Which country has developed in the impressive way environmentally, politically, and uh, economically? Um, Germany really has to be uh, a model to me. Uh, when, I, when I look at a lot of dysfunction in Europe, it occurs to me um, societies that invest in education do better. I think Europe learned the, in a very costly way the downside, the, the cost of having a gullible society uh, when Hitler came to power and took that country to war. And I've noticed now, when it comes to investing in the electorate, there's, it's not a partisan thing in Germany. I, I am, I'm afraid in, in our society, I have this strong feeling that one wing of our political spectrum would like us to be less educated and easier to advertise to and the other is more interested in investing in creative thinking and this kind of thing. Um, Europe is beyond that. Europe wants everybody to be able to think on their own and be a creative thinker, not because they're right wing or left wing, just because it's better for their stability and their society. Uh, Germany uh, is a leader in Europe, and Europe needs a leader. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of division in European societies, just like there's division in our societies. And in the North, you have societies that seem to work better. And to me, a lot of it is because of trust in institutions. It really saddens me when people's default is no trust in that institution. I think I'm more trustful of institutions here just because I think there's a value in trust for institutions. Uh, and it's my hope that they deserve and earn the trust. But if we don't trust our institutions, we're not going to get to first base. Our, our democracy becomes very fragile and our society is in trouble. More questions from the audience? We've got Andrew. Yeah, uh, yeah, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your outstanding presentation. Grand Slam home run. That's American, but you know, I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> I, I don't know to, anything about soccer. I have soccer. to be careful when I talk to my tour guides because I love those kind of metaphors and they don't, they don't know what a home run is, yeah. <laughs> but I do. Anyway, the question I wanted to ask, please, is that my nephew and I are going to be visiting London in uh, early June. And boy, would, would we love to attend question time in Parliament. However, when I did some research and corresponded with Parliament's tourist department, whatever they're, they're called, uh, they made it very clear that, it, that you have to be a British subject to get tickets. As, as far as standing in line, which we could do, that was also made very clear that unless somebody else doesn't want to uh, attend who has tickets, uh, nobody standing in that line uh, might attend. 
do you know any trick we could use to, to get in there? Uh, I think the parliament in Edinburgh is a little more welcoming. Uh, that's up in Scotland. You could go to there and, and hear them in action. I think, I, from my experience, parliament is, if there's anything interesting going on, then you can't find a seat. But if there's just mundane business going on, you're much more likely to find a seat. Also, a lot of times they meet in the evening when it's easier to get a spot. I don't know the latest on that, but my, my staff does. And you're welcome to send an email to rick at ricksteves.com. And I've got, that's what my staff does, is answer these kind of questions. But um, uh, when I think about London, that's a great experience in London. Uh, you can also see the, the justice uh, uh, system in action at Old Bailey. And uh, that's something that is more accessible and quite an interesting uh, sightseeing experience for us. And I would remind you there's a company in London called London Walks. And uh, it's that simple, London Walks. And you'll see their black and white brochure all over town. And they are uh, teachers and actors and uh, uh, just people that love to share a different slice of London. And there's theme walks all over town. And you can learn a lot about London when you take some of those specialized walks. They're very inexpensive, and I think always time and money well spent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Maggie, do you have a question over there? Kristen? Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm with the Philadelphia International Airport. I travel quite a lot, and we're trying to connect people to the world. But one of the things that I have learned through my personal life is that food and music connects people. From your perspective, your personal perspective, which one is the best song that you had heard? <laughs> and which one is the best food that you could say, oh my God, I'm being transported to a different world? The best, food, best song I've heard and the best food I've had? I was in... Uh... I was in New Orleans uh, 10 days ago with my niece, and uh, she made a theme song for my visit, which was um, Enjoy Yourself. It's later than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy yourself while you're still in the pink. Uh, the years go by sooner than you think. Enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself. It's later than you think, old man. Um, and uh, I thought, that's kind of the live for the day message that you get in New Orleans. And uh, you get a lot of that in Southern Europe. Uh, you know, when you cross the border in, into Italy, my bus drivers and my guides have a ritual when we take our group across the border from Germanic Europe to Romantic Europe, Italy. They stretch and they go, ah, il dolce far niente, the sweetness of doing nothing. And uh, <laughs> Italy does not earn as much as Germany does, but nobody would say it's that simple. Because in the United States, we preface the word well-being with a hyphen and material. Material well-being. Who are you going to vote for? Who made me better off materially for years? You know? um, and in Europe, uh, they measure things differently than that. And uh, in Europe, they choose to work about 20% less, and they choose to produce 20% less. But by any fair estimate, Europe earn, produces as much per hour as we do and they just have a different pain-pleasure ratio. They have more serious uh, paternal and maternal leave and this kind of thing. Uh, and it's an investment in people's well-being. So those kind of songs in the South are good reminders of enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. As far as food goes, I just co-authored a book called Italy for Food Lovers by the go-to guy for Italian opera and cuisine, Fred Plotkin. And I'm so proud of this book. Fred wrote a book called Italy for the Gourmet Traveler 30 years ago. And this is an updated version with my everyman sort of practicality and Fred's sophistication. And uh, it's, uh, I'm very excited about that book. But for me, I go to the culture through the history and the palaces and the art and the architecture. But Fred has taught me you can go to the culture through the kitchen also and learn a lot about the culture through the cuisine. And uh, it's just really key in your travels to be that cultural chameleon and eat what's fresh and eat what's local. I like the notion that a good eater can go to a good restaurant, look at the menu, and know what month it is and where they are by what's on the menu. Because, you know, Italians and, well, Europeans in general, they don't insist on having all the variety all year long. They will eat white asparagus when it's white asparagus time and porcini mushrooms when it's porcini mushroom times and not vice versa. 
and they will need less fertilizer, less refrigeration, and they will eat better, and I think life goes better. So that's kind of a takeaway I have from Europe and eating and songs. Andrew, we'll bring a microphone to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, big fan. Uh, just curious, what's your best tips on now traveling with kids, younger kids, teenage kids, how to keep them interested, engaged, how to have them enjoy a trip, especially in the age of uh, social media here? Yeah. Didn't you say damn the teenagers earlier? Damn okay. the teenagers, yeah. Uh, 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 it depends on, you know, if you're talking really little kids, a lot of times people ask me, you know, I've got a little tiny tot, what, where should I go? And I say, to grandma and grandpa's on the way to the airport, really. <laughs> um, seriously, have a shorter vacation just with a, your, the mom and the dad, and then uh, do something with the kids later. But when the kids get older, it's wonderful. Uh, we took our kids out of school every April for three weeks uh, for, for 15 years. And the teachers applauded it uh, because it's so stimulating. And if you're an engaged parent, uh, you do your little homeschooling thing for those three weeks and the kids come back right in schedule. Um, and uh, there's nothing like exposing kids in that age to different lifestyles. And my kids really opened up to the world that way. Um, and uh, there's a lot of parenting tips that I don't have time to get into now, but I, I, always, I would always um, think, well, mom and dad are spending extra. For this vacation, uh, let's double the allowance also so you can have a little more fun on your vacation with us, but you don't get the allowance for nothing. You gotta write a journal. Um, I, I, I just think it's really important for kids to journal, seriously journal in your travels. I journaled in all my early trips and they are treasures when you get home. Um, good for you for thinking about traveling with kids. Uh, you take a big hit in what you can accomplish as individuals, but it's a great family experience, it's great parenting, and if you don't honestly factor the kids into the itinerary, the kids smell a, a rat and they just go on strike. So you gotta, you gotta do serious stuff the kids wanna do. <laughs> yeah. Got time for one more question. Hi, Rick. Uh, I'm currently a junior here at Villanova. My mom just texted. Uh, she uses your book like the Bible. So um, my question is, I'm a second generation Ukrainian um, and it's hard to keep the faith sometimes and keep hope, especially when family sends us pretty terrifying pictures and videos. Um, what is your best recommendation on keeping hope, especially as a youth? And with everything going on in the world, how can we maintain positivities from such far away? Thank you. Wow. That's a powerful question. And I'm going to try to figure out a powerful answer in a minute. But before I do, I just want to remind you, as you came in, you picked up a newsletter, and this has uh, my favorite experiences in Europe. It's a 64-pager, and it also explains all the things I do with my 100 workmates in Seattle. And we have, our website is just, um, you could go to school on it for all of this kind of material. Um, every question that's been asked, you could, you could search the website and find probably a video clip about it. Every TV show I've ever made, uh, is there just to click away our new art series. There's something for teachers called Classroom Europe where I've called, I've broken 130 TV shows into 500 little three-minute teachable clips. So you could type in water lilies and bam, you've got Monet. Uh, and uh, if you didn't know I did a show on Malta, you could type in Malta and find out, oh, there's a little seven-minute clip on Malta. I gave a talk for librarians uh, a few months ago and I just typed in libraries and I had five clips from, from five different shows on libraries, put them right together in their own playlist on the great libraries of Europe. But um, there's a lot of information in, in, on the website if you want more information about this. Every Monday we have a party. It was designed to help us get through COVID and it turns out to be quite a lot of fun. We have thousands of people that join us. We all drink the same wine and go to the same place. And it's my chance to highlight whatever topic we're talking about. So Italian cuisine, climate change, uh, Iceland, you name it. So it's all there. So I'll just uh, thank you for picking this newsletter up. And if you need more information, you can go to ricksteves.com. As far as the tragedy in Ukraine, oh, the other thing, um, some people wanted to get autographs and so on. What I like to do with a crowd like this is not have a polite line, but just pretend you're in Italy and kind of a mob scene, okay? <laughs> so what I'm gonna do a few minutes after we're all done, is I'm just gonna stand uh, in, in a roomy area in the back there, 
right there. And um, if you want to have anything signed with COVID and stuff, I'm going to keep it really fast. And I just ask you to open up what you want to get signed. I got my Sharpie and I go in a circle and you gather all around <laughs> and I just write my name as fast as I can until there's nothing else in front of me. Do you got it? It takes five minutes and I'll be able to autograph anything you put in front of me there. I'm not going to pose for photographs, but you're welcome to take photographs all you like. It's just if I pose for photographs, it just becomes very, very slow because we've got a dinner to go to a few minutes later. But immediately after, if you'd like an autograph and you want to get a shot of me from any angle, uh, I'm going to be right back there doing that. Okay, sorry for the ad there, but I had to explain that from a housekeeping point of view. And now about the um, how do you keep positive as a young person? <sighs> I wish I could be really cheery about that, but I think it's it's bleak because of the power of social media and the power of um, forces that want to dumb us down and make us afraid and build walls. Um, I do believe we each have to have to believe we make a difference as individuals. You can't say I'm going to work really hard at this and then stand back and well I didn't fix the problem. You know you've got to believe you're making a difference. I. I give, honestly, I, I get so much joy out of giving my talks just because I can challenge people to look at the world a little bit differently. Um, I could, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because this is why God put me here, I think. I just, I love this. It gives me energy. And we all need to share notes. Um, as far as Ukraine goes, it's my dream as soon as that war is over. God willing, it's going to be sooner rather than later. I want to take our TV crew there and celebrate Ukraine by making a one-hour special on Ukraine, just like I did on Iran or, or any other place I've, I've, I've featured. It's a real country with real people. How much do we know about it, unless you happen to be of Ukrainian heritage? It's high time we took a look at that country. And I'm very excited about that, and I just hope that um, that day will come sooner rather than later. Um, we need to recognize that this is my takeaway from COVID. The challenges that are going to front us going forward are going to be challenges that, that require good governance, that require an educated electorate, and that, requ that requires nations working together. If we didn't have good governance, if we didn't have an, an electorate that gets it, and if we didn't have nations working together, a force like Putin or you put, fill in the blanks, could steamroll freedoms and democracies all over this planet. But because we've got institutions and we've got democracies that pay for people's education and parents that make sure they're, you know, they, they follow through and help their kids uh, ha have that, the power education gives them, and uh, programs like here at Villanova that, uh, in, that enable people to go and get to know the rest of the world. All of that makes a big difference, and we need to feel good about that. Uh, we need to, I think we need to expect our neighbors and our loved ones to recognize that also in a, res in a respectful way. So I hope that uh, helps a, a little bit, uh, and we can all keep Ukraine and the sad people living under Putin in Russia uh, in, our, in our thoughts and prayers. With that, please join me in thanking Rex Steves. Thank you.